Hey everybody, welcome back for my Tuesday No Better, So Better series. This month I've been covering between service maintenance, which is not meant to replace routine service or maintenance on your machine, but it does help in between, especially if you sew with any of those materials we've talked about that shed a lot, like fleece. Fleece is, our, is a big, big one. If you even sew one project with fleece, your machine needs some attention. Flannel, um, linty, thread, batting, things of that nature. If you sew frequently, um, you know, this is just in between care. What I covered in the last two weeks, the first week was just basics on um, cleaning the bobbin area on both drop-in and vertical bobbins. And then last week we covered the needle bar area, the check spring and the tension disc and some other um, <clears throat> some maintenance in that area. And this week we are going to cover signs that your machine already needs um, some, some not like beyond between service maintenance, more like an actual service or a maintenance call. Um, the reason that I'm doing this series and most of my programs is a couple of reasons. One is the biggest thing is we need to be more self-sufficient. Um, service shops don't look like they used to. We don't have near as many. They're hard to get to. They're costly. I know with the economy kind of in a downward trend, um, there's less money for fabric, there's less money for groceries, there's less money for gas. And even though you're going to keep on using your sewing machine, I know because I feel it myself that the the budget there to do just routine maintenance on your machine is getting harder and harder to meet. So I'm trying to do everything I can to give you some tips on how to extend out that service. And honestly, with my programs, how to skip as much um, service calls as possible. So I will talk more about that at the end. If you're joining me for the first time, welcome. My name is Andy Barney. I am a professional uh, sewing machine service technician on home domestic machines, sergers, things of that nature. And I um, am building the Sewing Doc Academy to help you become more self-sufficient in the care of your own machines. We also are um, teaching the next generation of technicians to open up their own shops, to build a side business, retirement income, um, and do community outreach through charity projects, such as volunteering for senior centers or refugee centers. Um, people come into our programs for a variety of reasons, and we cater to all of them. So thank you for joining me. This is the third week in this series. Next week will be our open house for the Remove Your Cover series. Again, I'll have more information at the end of the broadcast. And you can watch our Facebook page and YouTube channel for more details on the open house. All right. So I'm going to get started. I have all slides today. I don't have any videos. So I'm going to add this to the stream and get myself situated here. All right. So again, we're covering signs that you need service and what happens in service. I feel like this is a really good topic to cover um, because I know that many of you have religiously taken your machines in for service. Um, and some of you only take your machine in when something's wrong. And some of you may not even know that service exists. I get all um, a whole range of, of experience with people in service, not knowing that we even exist or that machines actually do need care. So we're going to talk about what actually happens when your machine comes in for service. Now, most shops are very similar in this. There may be some variances. I'm going to give you what it looks like price-wise in our shop. Um, you know, but that may vary in your region, but I just want to give you a comprehensive look at what service is. So again, we're going to talk about subtle and obvious signs that your machine really needs to go in for service, or you need to learn how to do it yourself or, and also what they do when you take your machine in for service. I'm going to re only repeat a few of the important reminders that I've given you every week of the series. Uh, in, in my program. That is that this maintenance, anything that I've taught in the series absolutely does not replace routine service. What I'm teaching you is just between uh, service maintenance. So you still need to periodically have your machine opened up, cleaned out, re-lubricated and checked. All right. Um, do not try to remove the covers without proper instruction. If you are itching to remove the covers to get in there and clean out and do this maintenance, our open house is next Tuesday at 2 p.m., same time slot as this. And we're going to open the doors to a maximum of 100 people. This is a beta program, which means it's a test program. We will grow it into something bigger, but this is a reduced cost um, and you will own it for life. So we will have 100 slots open 
next week for this. And we will teach you how to properly remove the covers, get in there, clean out, lubricate, and close it back up without issue. So don't, I do not recommend using YouTube. I don't recommend using um, fly by the seat of your pants methods. This is how machines end up going into the service shop in pieces with a whole lot of additional cost. And I asked you to please not use canned air ever. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of what happens when you do use canned air. Uh, I know that canned air kind of gets all of the uh, <clears throat> lint and dust out of your line of sight, but that usually just pushes it further in the machine and causes bigger issues. All right, so let's go through some signs that you need service. The first one is pretty obvious, squeaks and squeals. This could sound anything like a, a small little mouse in your machine, and it could be a, a, a sound that's growing as you sew. Um, it could be any part of the machine. It could be coming from the motor side where the belt is. It could be coming from the hook. It could be coming from the needle bar. Doesn't matter. Squeaks and squeals are usually a sign that there's a lack of lubricant. Um, now, uh, along those lines, I'm going to like go off on a tangent a little bit, but there's always a lot of confusion about lubricating machines. I always say the first thing you need to do is read your manual. If you've never read your manual about maintenance or anything, you need to read your manual. To be fair, most modern machine manuals quite frankly, they suck. Uh, a lot of our programs are meant to compensate for what they should be telling you in your manual that they don't. Some of that is translation issues. There is not a single sewing machine that's produced in the United States. So they all go through some form of translation. And I think they get skimpier and skimpier in the amount of information they offer. What you're probably going to find is you may, it's going to tell you to maybe add a drop of oil on the hook if you have a vertical bobbin or in the wick in the middle of the hook assembly or the hook race if you have a drop in bobbin. Jukies that are semi industrial or straight stitch only, Brother 1500s and the Husvarna diamond, whatever the, the, uh, the quilting machine is, those may be a little different because they do require a little more lubrication. But when it tells you just to put a drop of oil in the wick, that's all you should do. What happens is, um, and they'll, they'll tell you that they're self-oiling, that there's no need for oil, and that is absolutely true. The reason is um, they do impregnate metals with lubricant now to hold you over. So you're not needing, if you add oil in the wrong places, it's going to cause that lubricant to leach out and cause bigger issues. But what's expected of you is that your machine goes in every 12 to 18 months or so for service. The technician gets in there, opens everything up to get all of the lint and debris out before adding any more lubricant. So this is why they're, they're not telling, they're telling the user not to oil anything. And that's because there's a specific process. So when you hear squeaks and squeals, don't just open the, try and get in the machine and squirt oil in places because you can really do some irreversible damage. Um, it could be the motor pulley weakening um, or threads caught in the motor pulley, which does cause damage over time. And again, this is one of the reasons why your machine needs to go in periodically because we're going to catch things that you're not going to see. Even if you open up your machine, there's probably things in there you're not going to know what to look for. So I'm going to give you a really good example here. This was just six months ago. This was a customer that had, I want to say this was a brother, like an Innovus Dream Machine or a Viking. I can't quite remember. I want to say it was a brother um, Innovus though. This is um, not a case I've ever seen before. This is inside the machine and this is the, the timing belt that links to the motor. Okay. This is your mo this little wheel here. Um, this is your motor belt. So then this is the motor pulley. What's scary, so this belt here that you see where all this thread is, the customer had no idea this was here. Um, and if we, she hadn't brought it in for service, we would never have caught it. But what's really scary is that she'd been using the machine in this condition for a good seven or eight months, she thinks. And the only reason she noticed was every once in a while, the hand wheel would get really hard to turn. And it seemed like her, her timing was probably slipping. How in the world she managed to even sew on this thing is beyond me. But what's crazy, so you have all this thread piled up. And actually, let me show you a, a close picture. So you have all this thread piled up. And this was actually some of this I had already removed. There's an entire block right that goes in front of this that I'd already removed thread from. So if I had only kind of done half my job, I would never have even discovered this. Okay. So even like I said, even if you were able to get into this machine, you likely would not have found this because it's behind some parts I had to remove. I only know because I could tell something was not right with the machine. 
So to me, what's absolutely scary is that this timing belt is super tight on the shaft when there's not thread on it. See this little tensioner here actually causes it to be a tight belt. So what could happen potentially with all this strain on this belt, that belt connects to the needle bar up top, the shaft, the main shaft. This could actually cause a warp in the shaft and in the um, this is not the motor pulley, but this is the, the bottom half of the machine that controls the hook. You could actually cause some warping between these two shafts if this went on long enough. So it took me hours and hours actually to get all of that thread out of there. Um, I think it was three hours total. And I did have an, uh, a picture at the end with all the thread in my hand that came out of this. And it was pretty insane. If you're wanting to know how this could even happen, um, I re if I remember correctly, there was our, there was some thread that was caught up in this uh, in the motor belt area, which is closer to the outside of the machine. Um, sometimes people use their extra spool uh, pin at the top of the machine to store another spool of thread, or if you have another machine close to it where the tail of the thread is hanging, all it takes. Now, if you remember what I said months ago. The reason why machines get so much lint on the inside is it's like a tiny vacuum. As soon as you plug it in, turn it on, and hit that foot pedal, that motor becomes a vacuum that sucks things into the machine. So all you need is for a tail of thread to be close enough to get sucked into the vent or to the hand wheel or what have you and gather. And as soon as it catches one of these belts or a, a shaft, this is exactly what's going to happen. Um, I can't remember if that was just um, like dirty thread, but if you can tell, there's actually two different colors of thread. I want to say that they were actually two different colors of thread. This one might have absorbed some dirt, but I'm pretty certain this one was white and this one was cream. So she went through two spools of thread with uh, things getting caught in there. So this was resolved, but this is this is the kind of thing that happens when you ignore um, squeaks and squeals, things going weird and wonky with your machine. Okay, so that is an extreme example, but this happens on the hand wheel a lot too, especially on Viking machines. So obviously we have loud noises, um, a clunking noise where every time the machine operates, you hear thunk, 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 thunk. All right. Um, if the machine is vibrating more. So like if every time it thunks, you're starting to see the machine kind of vibrate around the table. Um, chunks of lint might be jamming the feed mechanisms or the gears. This happens a lot. Um, a, usually a clunking noise will indicate that there's something stuck somewhere that it shouldn't be. Um, and then I do want to, want to also note that the exception to this sort of, if you've had it serviced and you know everything's good, um, lower end machines usually do get louder over time. That's the nature of machines. So we're talking about if you go to Walmart or Joann's or Amazon and buy a $99 machine, $120 machine, I'd say anything less than $300 on a machine, you're especially the Singer brand. Um, I don't think I experience this quite as much with Janome or Brother, but Singer machines, the lower end ones, even the Quantum style series, which I can't think of the numbers off the top of my head. Um, over time, the, the construction just sort of relaxes and everything gets louder. Okay. But that doesn't mean that there's something wrong. Um, but if you know that your machines, so if your machine's been serviced and it's still noisy, that's the nature of the machine. If you've not had your machine serviced or it's been neglected, this is probably what we're looking at. Um, this was the best example in my old files that I could find from my customer machines. I just didn't have time to dig up others. But this little black piece that rides on this white here, this is part of the feed mechanism on a lower end machine also. So that little black thing rides across a cam here that raises and lowers the feed dogs and also helps guide um, the, the front to back uh, motion. But when all of this lint gets compacted up there, these pieces can't meet properly. So you may see your feed dogs kind of going up and down, but not front and back or the opposite or just something's not feeding right. And when it gets louder, that's usually an indication that you have um, things all jammed up in there. And here I'm going to, there's my little arrow to point to exactly what I'm talking to. All this compacted lint is going to affect the feed mechanism. Um, this is a really, really big one. I cannot stress this one enough. When the hand wheel gets to be hard to turn, you're already kind of, um, be, you're already into needing service. So you may not notice it at first. And the hardest part about this is with computerized machines. When you're used to pushing a button for the needle to go up and down, or if your machine has its settings so that it always ends in the up or down position, you never have to turn the hand wheel. You may not notice that your machine's working extra hard to keep everything going. So 
if you have a computerized machine, I do recommend turning your hand wheel every now and then just to make sure everything's good. When it becomes noticeable, the problem has already been there for a while. So if you start to notice your hand wheels getting hard to turn, you're almost in critical need of having a machine uh, maintenance session. So you need to have it done to prevent a full seizing of the machine. Full seizing means that you can't turn the hand wheel or you have to try really hard. It's going to be jammed completely. And that's going to require a chemical clean to get everything moving again, get some lubricant in there. All right. Um, so like I said, it's usually a severe sign that lubricant is gone in at least one area of the machine. So that could be the needle bar. It could be in one of the bearing joints. It could be in the hook gears. You could actually have lint jammed into a hook gear. If you broke a needle recently, the tip could be stuck in the gears. There could be any number of issues. Um, so when the machine is fully seizing and you got to have chemical clean, um, and I, it does mean that it's going to cost you extra, but I can't really think of any situations where um, I wasn't able to save a machine if it was seized because of lack of lubricant. Um, th this can happen when gears break or things like that. But in, in most cases, a fully seized machine does not mean lost cause. I want to give an example. This is one of the machines with an absolute known issue. And I mentioned it in my presentation last week in terms of the needle bar area. But this is a Brother CS6000i, which is a low-end computerized machine. They're good machines. Um, I have numerous customers with machines. The one downside is that they are prone to seizing up at least once in their lifetime. So it may be within the first year that you get it. Not likely, unless you sew a lot of linty things. But if you have it for more than five years, chances are if you're not having it serviced regularly, you will experience it being seized up. To give you an example of what this looks like in my shop, um, the Brothers um, CS6000i, our regular service fee for a computerized machine is $99 in this category. For me to unseize it and get it moving usually takes a couple days of chemical soak. And then we leave it sit even longer and keep testing it to make sure you're not going to take it home. And if it sits for a couple days, it's going to seize up again. So we have an additional $35 to $65 charge depending on how much labor it takes for us to get it unseized. So you're looking at, you know, 100 35 to $165 to get your machine running again. Not catastrophic. Um, I know that the solution in the past has been, well, I'm just going to get a new one, um, which I find ironic because so much of our culture is about less waste, um, not single use plastic. So as much as I can, um, I would like to prevent machines going to the landfill or uh, just being passed off as done. So we do teach this inside of our Remove Your Covers program for machines like this. Um, and then, of course, if you've waited too long, it's possible things seized up where one area of the machine stopped moving and the rest kept moving and something breaks. Any additional costs would be determined by the labor needed. And our shop, our fee is $60 an hour for uh, repair labor in addition to your normal costs. So that just gives you an idea of what a fully machine a fully seized machine might look like. If you have a higher end machine, like a any of the Viking designer series or like a brother or um, baby lock higher end that's harder to get into, you might see more additional cost to that. All right, so I don't know how else to describe this other than a ting, 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 just like this little, it'll be rhythmic because it's, you know, as the machine rotates, you'll hear ting, ting, ting. Ting. Okay. So that's my ting ting noise. I don't know because I, I don't know what else to call it. So um, it's usually when the machine's in operation, obviously. If you turn your hand wheel, you won't likely hear it. It's whenever the machine is moving at a pace that you can hear it. So it's likely that your needle is slightly bent or warped and hitting the hook. So this is um, why constantly I myself and other technicians preach to you that you've got to change your needle regularly. When you don't, you're going to have um, a bend or a warp to it over time that you can't see to the naked eye or feel or any indication. But if it's continually hitting your hook in a way that's damaging, you're going to have to pay to have that hook replaced. And you're looking at a couple hundred dollars um, pretty much for any machine or, you know, some machines don't even have replacement parts. So um, it will damage your hook over time if you're ignoring this. Um, so change your needle. If that doesn't fix it though, so if you put a new needle in your machine and you still hear it, chances are your machine needs adjustment. That means that the needle is hitting too close to the hook. The hook has a very specific 
a very, very microscopic setting where the hook has to come behind the needle to pick up the thread. So it needs to be as close as possible without touching. And over time, especially if you're using heavy duty fabrics, you know, you could be, there should be, there could be a little shift in your needle bar or something. The timing might be slightly off that's causing that to hit. Um, one exception to this is in uh, sewing machines or embroidery machines. So here, this is a PE770, which is an embroidery only, but there's also like the Innova, the, the Innova's Dream Series for, for Brother, the, the Baby Locks, all of those, anything that's an embroidery machine, the clearance is actually slightly tighter. So it is designed so that the hook does brush the back of the needle. If you're using an embroidery machine or an embroidery sewing combo machine and you hear that ting noise, that part is normal. So that is an exception to this rule, if that makes sense. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about bent or broken needles. And what you can see in this picture here is this needle has just the slightest bend down here at the bottom. This will mimic the timing being off because that hook, so you should, this should come straight down here. That means that the hook is going to miss that, um, the tip of that needle uh, and you're not going to get fully formed stitches. Uh, <clears throat> I'd say it's more rare that needles actually bend rather than break. And that's because usually if there's something happening, the needle is going to come down and hit something and snap because they're just aluminum um, steel blend needles, right? So it might happen periodically, but it is a good reminder, again, that bent, bent needles do mimic timing issues. So if you have a one-off situation, I'm not that worried about it. Typically, if you're using heavier fabrics or elastic or something, and you're pushing and pulling the fabric through instead of letting it feed itself, chances are you're going to bend the needle or break it. Uh, and that's just because you're, you're trying to control the feed when the machine is trying to control its own feed, okay? So if it happens once in a while, I would not be concerned. If it's happening over and over again, especially if you're sewing with just regular cotton, then that's definitely a sign that it's an adjustment issue. So likely your timing is slipping to where it's hitting the hook, the clearance is off, could be any number of issues. But if you have an ongoing bent or broken needle issue, you really need to stop using the machine until you can have it looked at. My biggest concern on machines is that if it is moving closer to hitting the hook, one of these days that's going to come down and that needle is going to slam into that hook and you can do some serious damage um, to the needle bar. And in fact, I had a customer several years ago at our Kennesaw shop. Um, I had to replace her entire needle bar in her brother machine because it actually caused the um the steel to bend right where the needle sits. So you don't want to keep working under these conditions where you might risk further damage to your machine. Again, ignoring this issue can cause permanent damage or expensive repair. So um, change your needle often. And if you keep having issues, please have it looked at. If your bobbin thread won't pick up, this is a sign. Um, now it could be, again, a bent or warped needle. So always try a new one first. Um, it could also be a simple threading issue. Usually, if you have a threading issue, you can still get the bobbin thread to pick up. It's just that your tension is going to be bad. The thread's going to break. But this is an issue where the thread won't pick up at all, right? Um, if troubleshooting doesn't work, and I say that because the other symptom I see sometimes is, you know, customer would pick up a machine from me, fully service tested, 100% working. Then they take it home and they pull out knit fabric. And the machine, the needle that's going to be on the machine is not going to be for knit fabric. It's going to be a, a sharp point. So if you don't have the right needle on your machine, when you go to sew knits, you're going to have, you might not be getting stitches picking up. Okay. But if troubleshooting doesn't work, then I almost guarantee you it's a timing issue, which is still a routine service, but that has to go in. Um, so again, make sure it's a new needle when you test this. This is thread caught on a bobbin case. Um, we walk through this a lot in the troubleshooting program, but it's more like this symptom here where you see every rotation is just the thread piling up on the bobbin there. Um, there's a couple uh, things to look at with that. Um, usually, I will say from experience, it's typically that the, the wrong bobbin type is in the machine, which happens so easily. If you own multiple machines, you've probably done this before where you're like, I don't even know which machine this bobbin goes to. 
or you mistakenly assume that all bobbins work for all machines. So that's very common. Um, you might have burrs on the hook or on the bobbin case that need to be removed. It could be a simple fix through troubleshooting. If those measures don't fix the issue though, then this is a sign that the machine needs to be adjusted or the timing. Yeah, the machine timing needs to be adjusted. Um, and that's usually because the hook is coming around to pick up at the needle and either the hook is too late. So you have this going on or it's too early. So you have this going on. What you need is this right here. So this is your needle. You have this right here. Okay. So that's usually a sign that your timing is off. And unless you know how to adjust timing yourself with really good skills, which took me years to learn, it's got to go in for service. Um, and again, I'm begging you, please do not use YouTube to try and adjust timing yourself. First of all, like I said, there's a lot of troubleshooting things that actually mimic timing. The majority of customers I've had that have attempted to do this themselves, it wasn't even the timing to begin with. Um, and we're going to talk about how often timing is off on your machine, but the chances of the timing be off are slim. But when you go in there and you start um, loosening things, when you Google YouTube videos, you're going to get things that might be similar to your machine. It might be not even be your exact machine, but all machines are different in their setup. So you're going to make things worse if you don't know what you're doing. So I'm urging you to please not rely on somebody's sketchy YouTube video to learn timing on your machine. So we have skip stitches on one side of a zigzag, or in this case, you can see the zigzag is definitely skipping. And then even in the straight stitch, the stitches are skipping. So I'm going to repeat a little bit here. You're going to re always replace the needle first. A bent needle or a flawed needle is going to mimic the timing being off. If you're not getting any stitches whatsoever, that's definitely a sign that your timing is off. When you have skip stitches where it's missing, this is usually a timing issue or troubleshooting issue. So you want to make sure you're, again, using the correct needle type, especially for using stretch or knits. If you're using a jersey fabric, a knit fabric, anything with stretch, and you have a sharp point in there, you're going to absolutely get skip stitches. It's going to be frustrating. You may It may not even sew. So you have to have the right needle. All right. Um, if you're only getting a straight line when doing a zigzag. So let's just say you can see like these skip stitches in here, but it's skipping completely on one side and comes out looking like a straight line. Then that's usually a, uh, a slips timing issue. All right. So if you have any of those things, um, it's definitely time to either learn how to care for your machine yourself or get it into the service shop. So now I want to talk about what is service. Um, and there's always a lot of confusion about this. And especially when I have a customer says, well, I've been servicing my machine myself for 20 years. And I'm kind of like, oh, really? Because it's a little bit more than just dusting out lint and dropping some oil in there. Okay. So there's two sides to service. The first one is troubleshooting, cleaning, and lubricating. This is 90% of what's done to your machine. The other side is the adjustments and repairs. And to be honest with you, I would say, I'm going to repeat this a couple times, 90% of the time when machines come in for service, it's all, it's all right here. Now in my shop, we do check and all the time we check everything because that's what we do. We have a very regimented routine of what we go through on every single machine, but for 90% of machines, this part can go away. And we just focus on this part on the left, the troubleshooting, cleaning, and lubricating. So regardless of how the machine, when the machine comes in for service in our shop, we're always checking for missing or broken parts when the customer brings the machine in. For one, we need to know if there is anything being affected by the broken or missing parts. And we need to make sure that the customer knows that it came in like that when we got it. So that's knobs, levers, dials, spool pins, upper tension assembly, bobbin cases, bobbin covers, presser feet, faulty wiring, chew marks, bare wires. We power it on, make sure that the computer is functioning properly. Um, but all of those things are checked when they come in for service. And they, we mark everything on a form and it goes in their record. Um, then we shoot off into two different sides. First, we have troubleshooting, cleaning, and lubricating. And again, this is what's done to every single machine that comes in. But most machines, you could stop here and be fine. So for cleaning service, um, it's done to all machines that come in. 
Um, this is the routine service that actually keeps your machine going and prevents the need for repairs and adjustments. A lot of times timing slips because when you're sewing with heavy duty fabric, that's, that's kind of causing the machine to work harder. If you're getting, um, the thread nesting issues, that's causing it to hook on the yank or yank on the hook, that will definitely mess up your timing and cause, um, the need for adjustments. But more importantly to me, I think it's the computer boards. Keeping all the lint off of the computer boards is what extends its life. So we do this for every single machine that comes in for preventative measures. This is the part, if you do nothing else, this is what I would love for you to learn for your machine so that you can prevent it having to go in for adjustments. So again, I'm going to repeat this. Our shocking fact is that troubleshooting and cleaning service is the only service that 90% of machines need when they come into the shop for service. And I can tell you right now, the industry is angry for me. Uh, at me for saying this because it is the absolute truth. So many shops are making money off of your inability to do this part. So that's why we are on a mission to make sure you have the information so that if you don't have a server shop near you, you're not driving three hours to somebody who's doing all of the work that you could be doing yourself. All right. So after we've done all of that, we get the machine on the bench. Um, first, we go through test sew and troubleshooting. So keep in mind that we've had a conversation with the customer. They've let us know what's bothering them, if they're, if they're having skip stitches, if it's making a noise, if it won't sew anymore, if they want to throw it out the window and move on. They've told us their life story on this machine. And the first thing we do is we do a test sew. So we do a very controlled environment. I covered this in week, I want to say week three. It's either week two or week three of September's uh, or yes, yeah, September's um, No Better, So Better series. So go back. If you if you need the link, let me know and I'll link to it. Um, I covered how to do a test sew in a controlled environment. And the reason we do this is the variables that I've talked about. If the customer is at home sewing on a knit, fabric and only using a sharp needle, but they think the timing is off, we have to be able to narrow down the actual issue to the machine. So we re basically get reset, take everything back to basics. We use a brand new needle. We use only quilting cotton and we use a high quality thread so that we can test everything at the basic level and determine are there actual issues with the machine? Is it a user error or is there some minor fix that can be done to the machine? Nine times out of 10, it's user error or some minor fix that needs to be done to the machine. But we need to know. So what you can see here is a sample that's got um, Tesso front and back and some notes on it. Um, we always keep in mind what the customer told us as we work through the process and we constantly listen and watch the machine through the whole process. Again, this is one reason why YouTube is not going to be great for um, troubleshooting any issues with machines or telling you how to fix it because uh, technicians do build an intuition with guidance on what to listen and look for. Then we remove the covers, which for plastic machines is a little bit more labor intensive. So we take off um, all the covers that we need to to get into the machine. Um, and that's, you know, that's the hard part is, is this right here. Um, this is a customer that specifically told me for years, well, told me that for years that she had been servicing her machine herself. Before we moved into the area, there was really no one. She would have had to drive a couple hours. So she serviced it herself which meant cleaning out the bobbin area, using a little bit of canned air, and she called it good. Well, when you do canned air, this is exactly what happens. It pushes it down into the machine and compacts. Um, almost any time that there is a shelf of lint like this in the front, I know that somebody has been using something to push it down into the machine rather than a pipe cleaner or something that I had mentioned to pull lint back out. And I'm not going to blame that person and say that's what they did. Um, there are cases where this can happen, but nine times out of 10, when this happens, it's because canned air was involved or some kind of air pushing it into the machine. So when we get in there to clean the machine, all of this lint and thread, everything has to come out of the machine, including old lubricant. We always check for hidden threads, compacted lint issues. There's a lot of nooks and crannies where things can gather. And as you've heard me talk about before with threads, all it takes is one little thread to get caught somewhere and for that thread to keep grabbing other threads and then you have a mess of threads. And we also make sure computer boards and components are free of lint. That is one of the absolute most important aspects of cleaning with the machine open.
So I've got a few examples here when I talk about hidden issues. This customer brought in her machine, didn't even know there was an issue. I happen to notice a teeny tiny thread poking out um, on one side of the bobbin winder. So when I pulled off the cap here, all of this is what I started to pull out. And I decided to go ahead and take a picture before I removed it all completely. But all of this was hidden way down under the plastic where she would never have seen it. So this can really cause damage on your computerized machines, keep in mind, it's not just one computer board in the front where the screen is. There's tons of little tiny uh, boards in other places. And there, in fact, there's one for the bobbin winder on most of these advanced computerized machines. So if this would have wrapped itself a, the right way around one of those boards, you could be looking at a board replacement. Um, now, this is on a Viking. And one of the known issues on Vikings is that when people neglect their machine for too long, the lint starts to build up under the hook area. This is the hook, the circle here. This is your hook or your race, your hook race. And it's hard to tell, but everything you see in that window is fully compacted lint. That means that this machine has been neglected probably for a very long time, unless she just sewed like 60 pairs of fleece pajamas. So this is a danger call. This means that this is well, even what you see here is only a tiny fraction. This whole well is going to be full of lint. That also means the entire front well of this machine is going to be compacted like in the previous picture that I showed you. So we know where to look for all of the hidden places where lint gathers that aren't obvious even inside the machine. Um, as far as old lubricant, here's a few examples. Granted, our modern machines don't get grease the same way that uh, vintage machines do. But these are two machines that are in the gray area, which are kind of the 80s. Um, where they can either be considered vintage or they can be considered modern. Uh, all of this old sticky stuff will gum up the machine. I almost guarantee you that you can't zigzag on this machine given the buildup. So all of this has to come out. And yes, there I would consider them extreme examples, but this is not uncommon for a machine of this era. So all this sticky stuff has to get cleaned out and everything has to get re-lubricated. Uh, as far as machine boards go, again, this is kind of vital. So this is the inside of probably a, I think this is probably a Stinger Quantum if I had to guess. But in here you have your main board and you can see all those wires coming off of it. This is why it's imperative that you don't open the covers to your machine without guidance. Um, it's Getting the plastic apart is very difficult. And when you do, it'd be real easy to break or damage any of these boards. None of these wires are, they're in there, but if you accidentally move that cover too far, it's going to break off parts of that board. Um, and then you can see here on the left, on the right side, several smaller boards. So there's not just one board in your machine, just so you know. Here's an up close example of another one. This is a little bit more, this is like an LED um, electronic machine. So still has lots of boards and things that need to be cleaned. What happens is if you are not having your machine opened up and cleaned out periodically and you're doing it yourself, lint is building up on these boards. Like I said, when you plug in your machine, power it on and hit that foot pedal, that motor becomes a vacuum and it's sucking all the lint in your room into your machine. And it's going to settle because of the magnetic static nature on your boards. And that's what heats up and wears down your computer. So when you're not having your machine service regularly or you're not teach getting the skills to do it yourself, you're giving your dealer exactly what they want. They want you to neglect that machine so that in five years, you're going to have to come back and buy a new one or trade in or do whatever. Uh, and here's an example of one of those small boards that I was talking about. So it's not just the big computer board on one side. Your machine is filled with these little boards everywhere that control certain aspects. I imagine this one um, is probably either in a Viking or a brother probably a brother. This looks like a brother machine and it probably controls a lot to do in your embroidery function on the, um, with the upper tension assembly. Um, usually with embroidery machines, you have a setting for embroidery and a setting for sewing and the machine switches its course automatically. So that's an example of what the boards in your machine look like. So once all of everything is cleaned out, we do lubricate where necessary. Um, the gears and moving parts are lubricated. Every single brand has a different chemical-ish. Um, they're all fairly similar, but where they need to be lubricated is, and with what is a little bit different. So it kind of varies. It's not a one size fits all. Then we put the covers back on. We do a test sew. So you can see here, nice, clean. Um, this is probably overkill. Um, usually we pick about, uh, we always do zigzag and straight stitch. And then we pick about six of the specialty stitches just to make sure 
it's feeding properly, that the timing is correct with the needle and the hook, that the feed timing is correct, that everything's balanced. We check everything to make sure it's functioning as it should. Um, we always, same thing, still controlled environment, brand new needle on the machine. We do usually put a new bobbin in for our customer and give them back their original. Um, we do the same control test with um, quilting cotton, high quality thread, and then again, testing the specialty stitches to make sure nothing's skipping and that everything's even. So that being said, I want to tell you a little bit about the Remove Your Covers again. Remember that 90% of machines that have come into our shop need the troubleshooting, the cleaning, and the lubricating part. Yes, we do check for timing. We check for adjustments. We check everything, which takes us up to an hour just to check everything. But 90% of the machines that come in could get that first part, the cleaning and lubricating, and then go on their way and be fine for another 18 months. We do check all of it. They only need it um, occasionally. Um, so to give you an idea of what it looks like in our shop, uh, before we close, we just closed last month in order to focus on this academy. Um, but these were our prices when we closed. We offered full service with a 90-day warranty. Um, mechanical machines, which means no computers, no electronics, power, yes, but no, no LEDs, nothing, was $82. That's full cleaning, lubrication, troubleshooting, minor fixes, um, and then the, the warranty, all included in that. For electronic or computerized machines, it was $99 to $125, depending on the type of machine. So like your basic uh, a quantum stylist, um, anything that was not a large machine. So like your um, Viking Epics, pretty much any of the Viking designer series, anything that we have to do advanced computer diagnostics with would run us a little higher because most machines in that caliber, you're talking like the Epic series, the Brother, Anovis, Luminaire, Stellar, the Janome M7s, all of those would take us three to four hours on just a routine service with all of the, ca the calibration and computerized services. And then we have large embroidery machines um, for full embroidery service was 170, which I'm told is extremely reasonable for um, based on my competitors. But we, you know, we try to charge based on our overhead, not on the market. Uh, and then any repair labor beyond that was an average of $60 an hour plus the cost of parts. Now, <clears throat> for clean and lubrication only, you might find an independent, excuse me, an independent person that does that. You're looking at about $50 to $60. You will not get a warranty. And our shop, if someone pushed and pushed and only wanted this service because the timing clearly was fine, um, we would do it but we will not offer a warranty. And that's because we didn't have a chance to see what's going on in the machine or correct it so that when we just clean it and lubricate it, you're taking it back the same way that it was just cleaner. And we could not guarantee that the timing wasn't going to slip or there'd be other issues. You will be hard pressed to find a service shop that will only offer this option. But um, as an independent, I built my entire business for the first, I think the math I did was about six years. I only did cleaning and lubrication on machines. I did not do timing adjustments or anything like that. People are happy to pay um, just for the cleaning and lubrication part when someone's willing to do it. So, but most professional shops will not offer this option. So that brings me to this point um, on the Remove Your Covers program that opens next week for our beta launch testing. Um, the most common question I've ever gotten from customers is, can I watch over your shoulder to see how you service machines? Now, up in my shop, I would have said, absolutely not. There's a lot of OSHA things to be concerned with. It is nerve wracking when you're trying to do complex things with someone standing over your shoulder. So we had to say no. But we specifically built remove your covers so that, yes, you can actually watch over our shoulder and we'll teach you how to service and maintain your machine yourself. So I'm going to have a lot more details next week um, in our open house program. It is um, Tuesday, November 8th at... Um, 2 p.m. Eastern time. I'm not sure how that translates to other time zones. I will add that to our announcement so that you know what time to be there. But again, we only have 100 slots open. And that's because this is a beta program. No one has ever tried to do a program like this before. We are the first. We have a really good concept, but it's going to take us working with some humans to make sure we know what can be improved, where to put more focus. So you will get a lot more one-on-one -on -one as a founding member than you will 
when it actually has an official launch. So if you need any, um, if you have not already signed up for the open house, we do have one. Um, if you go to sewingdocacademy.com slash RYC, which stands for remove your covers, there is going to be an open house form there where you can add your name and email. It is only notification for that. So I'm not going to spam you with any unwanted um, emails, but you will get a replay of the open house if you can't make it. If you work during the day and you can't attend, we will send you a replay of the open house and you'll still get the same um, discount on pricing and any bonuses that we include. You're still going to have an option to do all that. So I highly recommend if you're even remotely interested in hearing what's in this program, because the hundred slots are going to go so super fast. Our wait list is um, about 600 strong right now for this program. So we can only take a hundred while we are in beta testing. So if you have any questions on today's program or any aspect of what I've taught, please feel free to leave them in the comments and I will go back and answer them. I will have a handout for today's um, session. So if you want that, please put that in the comments and I will send you the link. If you're needing any of the previous sessions um, for this series, it'll be at the same link. If you missed last month, as far as threading and um, perfect balance tension, all those things, I'm happy to link to that as well. I do appreciate that you join me for these live events. Um, we're not sure where November is going to take us yet, but I will have an announcement as soon as we have one ready. We are very focused on the Remove Your Covers um, Modern Machine Maintenance launch next week. So again, if you have any questions about that program, you will find a link on that page, the link down here at the bottom for Remove Your Covers. There is a chat box option so that we can actually have a chance to speak one-on-one. -on -one. If you have any questions about how it works, if it's the right program for you, I'm happy to tell you everything. So again, thank you for joining me and I will see you next Tuesday.